Hello everyone, hope you're good. So this week we got another one of those chapters that Oda loves to write, where he builds up the suspense and intrigue and makes the audience go, oh no, I can't believe that happened. Wait, what actually happened? What's gonna happen next? We continue with the Chiffon cover story and her and the fire tank pirates and little Pez find out that Lola was just in Dress Rosa a couple days ago. And then I read another translation and it got more confusing because that other translation said that Lola had left for Dress Rosa a while ago. So which one is it? I'm gonna say that it's the first one that you know Lola was actually in Dress Rosa because the guy who tells Chiffon that is actually pointing towards Dress Rosa like, hey, she was just here a couple of days ago. That's the one that makes the most sense. I think it's pretty obvious at this point that this cover story is going to end with Chiffon finally finding Lola and that Lola will be either in a very surprising place or with a very surprising someone, or both. We open up with Oda's silhouette fetish, because Odin is still a silhouette, and he remains a silhouette throughout this flashback. I do think we're getting closer and closer to finding out what Odin actually looks like, because I think I said this in my review of the closing of Act 2, where we have to find out more about Odin and his story and his connection to Wano, so that there's more emotional investment uh, before the fight actually happens. So the Odin flashback will be a way of getting people more invested in the emotional outcome of that fight between Luffy and Kaido and, you know, Luffy's allies and Kaido's allies. One thing we do learn, though, from looking at Odin's silhouette is that much like the Nine Red Scabbards, Odin was a very, very tall man. Those Wano jeans are serious business. We get to see the Oro Jackson in this, which is Goldie Roger's ship, built by Frankie's mentor Tom. We see that uh, the ship already has that mystery egg. We still don't know the identity of the egg. We don't know what that whole thing was about, what it hatched to be. So perhaps we'll find out during the Odin flashback in Wano. Now personally, in my speculation, I have connected that mystery egg to something related to the ancient weapons. Because if you look at the full body of the Odo Jackson, you see some mermaids at the front, right? Uh, mermaids, to me, it's like a clear reference to ancient weapon Poseidon, Shirahoshi, who's an ancient weapon. And then we don't see it in this chapter, but sometimes the Odo Jackson is depicted as having two wings, one on each side. So just like the mermaids in the front are a reference to the race of Fishman Island, or the Fishman race that contains mermaids and Shirahoshi and therefore you know, Poseidon, uh, the wings could be a reference to the people of Skypea, the, the Birkins, right? The people with wings. And therefore that would connect it to the ancient weapon Uranus, because Uranus in, in mythology is known to be the god of the sky. So so that could be the, the two out of three. And then the egg uh, could be that final final piece in the puzzle. So I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that Roger was trying to hatch that egg because whatever would hatch out of it would probably have a crucial connection to one of the ancient weapons. We see that Crocus is already on board, which means that Roger is already sick. He has already been diagnosed with a terminal illness because the whole reason they recruited Crocus in, in the first place as a doctor was to be able to uh, help Roger make that voyage. Because Crocus was like the only doctor that was good enough to be able to keep that illness in check, whatever it was. Now this flashback is said to be happening 25 years ago. And from what we know, we know that 25 years ago was also exactly uh, around the time where the Roger pirates got to Raftel and found the One Piece. So it's a very interesting timestamp because Roger became King of the Pirates 25 years ago. Uh, and then he died 24 years ago, so he died a year afterward. And that's important because this flashback takes place before Odin actually becomes the Shogun of Wano. And Rayleigh and Shanks and Buggy offer him some help, and he refuses that. So it's not like the Roger Pirates abandoned Odin and just kind of let him go by himself to become Shogun of Wano and then just kind of let him get killed by Kaido. This chapter makes it very clear that the Roger Pirates did offer help and that Odin said, just don't interfere, essentially. Like, this is a Kazuki matter, I'll take care of it. So not only did the Roger Pirates, like, you know, get denied the opportunity to help Odin, but by the time that uh, Kaido kills Odin, Roger is already dead. We get a nice Kampai moment with Odin and the rest of Roger's crew, very similar to the moments that Luffy shares sometimes with, you know, his friends when there's a victory or something to celebrate. Kampai! 
And in this case, what they're celebrating is Odin going back to Wano to become Shogun and then making that push to open up the borders. Again, unfortunately, there's a discrepancy between the translations at one point because Odin in one translation says that he's going to wait 20 years uh, for the dream to come true. And then in another translation, he says that this has been a 20 year long dream. So which is it? Him saying that him and his retainers are going to wait 20 years at this time, during, during the time that the flashback is set, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the flashback is set 25 years ago. So if you like flash forward uh, 20 years from that point, the Straw Hats are still not coming. Like you would still need to wait five extra years. Even though he's drunk, Roger actually thanks Odin for coming along on the voyage. And I'm, I'm guessing it has something to do with the Poneglyphs, because the Kazubi clan were expert craftsmen. In fact, they were, they were so pro that they essentially crafted the Poneglyphs. They knew all the Poneglyph secrets. They knew how to write them, they knew how to read them, and I still firmly believe that it was actually Odin who helped Roger carve up that message back in Skypea in that gold Poneglyph that, that Robin actually found back then. Because remember, Roger could actually read the Poneglyphs because he had the voice of all things, but he, I don't think he would be able to write them. I think that's a very, very, you know, uh, limited, unique technique that is, is only from the members of the Kazuki clan. So I think that Odin was the one who wrote that message. You get a little bit of Shanks's and Buggy's rivalry in this. Uh, they're upset. Well, mainly Buggy is upset because Odin calls Buggy... Buggy Jito, and Jito means second son. So obviously, Odin has a preference here because he calls Shanks Red Taro, and Taro means first or eldest son. So there's some obvious favoritism there. We also get to see Scopper Gavin in, in one of those panels, which is cool. We don't really know much about him. I wish we could find out more. We move on from the flashback to the opening of Act 3 of Wano, and as the curtains begin to part, all I can hear is the music from the anime of Komurasaki slash Hiyori playing the shamisen. I actually think it's super interesting though that in this case, in this occasion where the, the curtains begin to open up, we actually don't get to see Hiyori wearing that mask. In fact, we don't get to see like anything from like the waist up, right? We just see like somebody playing the shamisen. So this, this chapter is just covered in mystery even in terms of that. And so Act 3 starts up in Hakumai, Habu Port, which was actually the first choice. Habu Port was the place where the Alliance was supposed to meet to go to Onigashima Island, but they changed it because uh, somebody gave away the plan. So they changed the port from Habu to Tokage. So we see Orochi leaving Habu Port with all of his men to go to Onigashima Island to meet up with Kaido, and then poor Tokage is all messed up. It's like stormy, there's like, you know, ship wreckage all over the place, the scabbards are completely shocked. There's a lot of very subtle clues, a lot of very subtle setup that you kind of miss if you don't pay attention. Like there's there's a comment by one of the Oniwabanchu, Fukuro Kuju says like, oh, by the way, Kyoshido is gonna be the one to stay. And right there and then I'm like, wow, that is just super, super suspicious and convenient. Think about it, like, it's just the guy who we don't know that much about, who we know we're missing a piece about, just is not going to be part of this. Like, why? Is it because he has a more important role to play and that he has to be in the capital to perhaps help the Alliance or help Komurasaki? And then we get this girl that looks up at the sky and says, oh boy, tonight sure promises to be a beautiful full moon which just so happens to be the major requirement for the MiGs to go full Sulong form. So I think it's pretty obvious that the invasion is still 100% on, it's just that the start of it is going to be different than what they had planned. By the way, Okiku's samurai armor in this chapter looks boss. That is some really, really good art. Really, really cool design. Uh, I know there, there were some comments, some speculation of people thinking that perhaps Shinobu was actually the traitor within the Alliance who leaked the plans to Orochi. Uh, but given her reaction in this chapter where she's like essentially crying her eyes out, I, I don't think that that supports the notion that she's the traitor unless she's acting in that scene. You know, Rashi has a line in this where he asks about Nekomamushi, like, what happened to the cat? I guess he didn't make it. And so when I thought about that, I was like, 
well, you know, who else is missing here? Or, you know, a character that we haven't seen for a long time that should be around Wano is Sunisha. That elephant, like, what happened to that elephant? We haven't seen that elephant since the ending of Zoe, and we know for a fact that it has to be nearby because otherwise, how did Wano, Wano, how did Zoro and the rest get to Wano? Regardless, the people in the capital of Wano seem to be in high spirits because they're preparing for the fire festival and because they can drink alcohol. Again, what we know as the fire festival here in the series of One Piece is actually a real life festival in Japan, which is called the Summer Festival of Oban in Japanese. And this is a, a festivity that happens once a year where uh, the Japanese people welcome the spirits of their ancestors back to, to their home. And so they have music and they dance and they set up offerings and they also light the way uh, with lanterns uh, so that the ancestors don't get lost uh, and are able to find their way to, to the, the family that they left behind. There are a lot of similarities between this festivity in Japan and Day of the Dead in Mexico. So here's what I think actually went down. If you remember uh, back in the ending of Act 2 of Wano, we got a panel of Law, and Law was listening to what Orochi was saying about him finding out about the, the Alliance changing the ports from uh, Habu to Tokage, and he also found out about Hiori being alive. So Law hears Orochi talking, and he's like, crap, I gotta warn the Alliance, because we've already been found out. So he tells Luffy and the rest, it's like, we got to change the plans and we got to do it quickly because they already know that we're leaving from Tokage port, not Habu port. And so after that, in order to throw Orochi off, the Alliance left some fake wreckage and uh, maybe Nami used Zeus to create a storm to sort of make it seem like the storm had like, you know, messed up the Alliance and their fleet, their ships. I think maybe the reason for why Luffy didn't warn Kinemon or didn't tell the scabbards is because there's a traitor in that group and so if they had told them that, like, the traitor would have warned Orochi. This actually kind of supports the notion that Shinobu is the traitor. So maybe that's why the plan was not reported to Kinemon and the rest, because uh, Luffy and Law found out that there's a traitor in the, in the scabbard group, and they don't know who it is, so if they pass that knowledge to, to Kinemon, it could leak again, and the traitor will inform Orochi about the change of plan. And by the end of the chapter, Inorashi finds this boat that still works, that has not been destroyed, and I think they're going to be using that to head over to Onigashima Island. And then once there, that's where they're going to meet up with the Straw Hat Alliance. Because personally, I think that the Straw Hat Alliance is currently in hiding. It could be in the ships that Orochi has as he's sailing off. Maybe they're, they've infiltrated that fleet and they're hiding there. There's this thing in the chapter called Dashi, which is basically a Japanese float that they use in parades. Uh, the float is wooden and it has several floors and usually... Uh, these uh, floats carry statues of heroes inside of them. So maybe that's where Luffy is. He's hiding in one of those things. But above all though, there's actually two main reasons for why I think the Straw Hats are currently in hiding. Number one is the fact that Oda loves, and I mean absolutely loves, to give Luffy dramatic entrances when the, the climactic part of the arc is about to start. In Whole Cake Island, Luffy busted out of a cake to ruin the tea party. In Marineford, Luffy fell from the sky. In Fishman Island, there's a moment where Hody Jones is about to execute King Neptune and then Shida Hoshi screams for help. Luffy-sama! And then Luffy makes his surprise entrance by jumping out of a shark's mouth. And then after that scene, Luffy reunites with his crew and we get this full page spread of the entire crew together, which is something that we still need to get, by the way. The entire crew together in one place since Dressrosa it has to happen. This arc is very important for Oda. I cannot see Oda starting this fight without that epic, epic, full crew panel. But before that actually happens, though, I do think that we're going to get the Odin flashback, uh, especially because the Straw Hats already know the story of Odin. They were told that uh, in, act, in Act 1. Like, they were very emotional hearing that story, but we don't know what that story is. So somebody else has to tell us, the, the reader, uh, you know, the story of Odin, you know, via a flashback. So it's like flashback, final fight, flashback, final fight. He did the same thing in Fishman Island. He did the same thing in Dressrosa. He did the same thing in Whole Cake. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's how it's going to flow. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Overall, I thought the chapter was okay. Let me know what you thought about it down below. Let me know your theories and speculation about what you think happened during that those 24 hours that were missing. Like the video if you did, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and I will catch you guys later. Take care.
Bye.